just want them to know how much we appreciate that, but we appreciate our own church. Amen. We appreciate you that have come this morning. Without you, we would not be able to do what we are doing, and we just praise God for all of you that have come here this morning. This is Pentecost Sunday. Brother Richard did a good job on uh, teaching on Pentecost Sunday, and it's the day that they say the church age began, really, and uh, when the Holy Spirit was sent to this earth, hundreds of years earlier, on the same time, it was a feast of Shabbat, I think that's how you say it, a Jewish uh, feast, and uh, Moses received the law on the mountain at that same time. He received the law, and now, then the Holy Spirit was sent to this earth, and I just appreciate the fact that he can indwell his people. Amen. Amen. That we have the Spirit of God living within us. Amen. God is a mighty God, and there's nothing that he won't do for his people. Hallelujah to God this morning. I'm not going to be preaching because we do a lot of preaching on uh, the Spirit of God and the anointing and Pentecost and so on. God's leading me in another direction. But for you that are here this morning, I just thank God that we gather together here. Do you know how many people are not able to be here? That's right. Amen. Amen. That's right. But we're here from the Elgin Congregational Homeless Church. We have already, within the church, received our morning offering and our tithes, and I thank God for that. But I want you all to know out there that are listening, we do have a, a, a secure website. If you go to our home website, and there you can give an offering. You can pay your tithe if you're not able to be here. And I thank God for that. Praise Amen. the Lord. All right, we're going to go on this morning and we're going to worship God in song. Hallelujah. Come on, praise God this morning. All right, thank you, Lord. God said he would turn.
Come do it again. I don't know how to Stand up. There's no God like your Lord. Nothing. We must decrease and he must increase. Amen. 
Father, it is your spirit that does the work, that brings the word alive to the ears of the people. Let somebody be delivered this yes. morning. Yes. Let somebody be delivered this morning. Let yes. somebody that's listening realize that they need to go higher in the higher levels with you and that there's places that they can go in you, God, where they can overcome the things that the enemy throw at them. And God will not fail to praise you and to honor you for it's in the name of Jesus. That we ask it. And the church Amen. says, Amen. 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 I want to minister by the help of God this morning on walking on lower ground. Walking on lower ground. I want to use the book of Joshua as I said earlier in the service that uh, I'm not really preaching a Pentecostal message for Pentecost Sunday because we preached uh, so much of that here within this church. But God has just led me in this direction. I've had this on my heart and I've studied and I've, I've gone back and I've re-studied and I, I've prayed about it and I, I've talked to God about it and, and the Lord has just given me this to minister. Because the truth of the matter is there are too many of God's people that are walking on lower ground. They're walking on lower ground and they need to go to higher levels with him. This message this morning is not necessarily one that is for the, the, the outright sinner, but this is for one who says they serve God. They say they serve God, but yet they're having problems and the enemy keeps attacking them and they're staying on lower ground rather than moving up to higher territory. And that's what we want to look at this morning out of the book of Joshua. We want to look at chapter 3, verse 10, and then chapter 17, 12 through 18. Are you ready? Amen. Chapter 3 and 10. And Joshua said, Hereby you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites and the Hephites or the Hittites, and the Hivites, and the Perizzites, and the Gergeshites, and the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Chapter 17, verse 12. Yet the children of Manasseh could not drive out the inhabitants of those cities. But the Canaanites would dwell in that land. Yet it came to pass when the children of Israel were waxing strong that they put the Canaanites to tribute, but they did not utterly drive them out. And the children of Joseph spake unto Joshua, saying, Why hast thou given me but one lot and one portion to inherit? Seeing I am a great people, for as much as the Lord has blessed me hitherto. And Joshua answered them, If thou be a great people, then get thee up to the wood country and cut down for thyself there in the land of the Perizzites and of the giants, if Mount Ephraim be too narrow for thee. And the children of Joseph said, The hill is not enough for us. And all the Canaanites that dwell in the land of the valley have chariots of iron, both they who are of Beth Shean and her towns and they who are of the valley of Jezreel. And Joshua spake unto the house of Joseph, even to Ephraim and to Manasseh, saying, Thou art a great people, thou hast great power, Thou shalt not have one lot only, but the mountain shall be thine, for it is a wood, and thou shalt cut it down, and the outgoings of it shall be thine, for thou shalt drive out the Canaanites, though they have iron chariots, and though they be strong. And the church says, Amen. Amen. For the reading of the word of God, you might be seated in the house of God this morning. Let me begin by saying that I fully believe this morning that there is a place of abundant life and maturity where you and I, the people of God, 
a place where we have learned to stand, a place where we know who we are in Christ. But I must say this morning, Brother Richard, that not everybody is at that place. It's not always because of sin. Sometimes it can be because of circumstances that the enemy, Sister Judy, keeps bringing our way and we're having to stop and fight the enemy and stop and fight the enemy and sometimes we seem to go two steps forward and three steps back. Amen. Am I relating to anybody this morning? Amen. But God desires for you and I, his people, to walk in victory and to progress to higher ground. There are those, now I might get a little bit rough through this message. Some of you next week might not even tune me in that's listening by live stream. But I've got to tell it like it is. Hallelujah to God. But some of us sat in the church years and years and yet we never grow. They stay in the embryo stage of Christianity, but God desires for his kingdom people to grow and to advance, to move from one level to another level, from grace to grace, and from victory to victory, and from one level of faith to a higher level of faith. Now, the book of John, or Joshua, as we begin to study the Word of God, is actually divided out into two separate areas. Their number one is the going in and the taking of the promised land. When Israel went in to take the land. And then the second division is where that the enemies, they are dividing out the land by lots. The conquered territories and they're giving them to the various tribes. But the emphasis on the book of Joshua is the driving out of the enemy so that Israel could possess the inheritance that was promised to her by God. Now Israel had to conquer and destroy and drive out the pagan influences that were in the territory that God said belonged to his people. And this, Sister Tangy, is what many today are failing to do. Instead of conquering and overcoming the world, most of them are at the point to where you cannot tell the church from everybody else. God told Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 7, when you go in to possess the land, he said, I want you to utterly destroy every man, woman, and child and make no league with the enemy. Why would God tell them that? Because God knew that the inhabitants of Canaan were immoral. They offered child sacrifices. Their priestesses were nothing but temple prostitutes. The, 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 the temple male uh, priestesses were nothing but male prostitutes. And their temple, in it, they worshiped false gods. Their temples were the center of vice. And Baal, I pronounce it Baal, but I'll try to call it Baal, was their principal Canaanite god, and his wife was Astaroth, their goddess. And Brother Richard, they worshiped false gods, and God hated that. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. But there are many today who are doing the same thing. Because anything that comes between you and the worship of Jehovah God has become an idol to you. That's right. Amen. And God said, I am a jealous God and I will have no other gods before me. Mm -hmm. Amen. Now people, when I was coming up and in my early walk with God especially, people used to walk for miles in the snow. 
somebody give him a hand clap. Yes. Now I know this is not a message we can shout with this morning, but I'm going to tell you something. It'll help us to grow if we listen to it. If we pay attention to what God is saying to you and I, and I want to look at some of these enemies very quickly this morning and see how they affect us today. And for time's sake, I can't talk about all of them. I'll just do as many as I can until the Spirit of God said that's enough, and then I'll quit. Uh, I want to give just a brief uh, line or two of history about each one of them and then bring out how they affect us today. Is that all right? Amen. Well, it don't matter. I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> But the, the first one I want to talk about are the Canaanites. They were the descendants of Canaan, the son of Ham, the grandson of Noah. And the word Canaanite actually serves as, as a catch-all, like an ethnic, ethnic term, and it covered the various tribes of the local uh, people who, the populations that lived in the Promised Land. And according to the Old Testament student manual that was uh, written by the church, uh, they were descendants of Ham, and Ham's wife, uh, Ham's wife uh, was a descendant of Cain. Y'all know who Cain was? He slew Abel. He slew his brother. And most of the Canaanites, they were scattered everywhere, but most of them lived in an area called the Low Country, west of the Jordan and the Dead Sea. They lived in a low country. And spiritually speaking, that represents to you and I the enemy of depression. Y'all know anybody in depression? Y'all know anybody that struggles with a condition called depression? Yes. A, a, a low area? The devil wants to kill your effectiveness with depression. Mm -hmm. And Webster says it means to be sunk down or in a state of hopelessness or to be in a low state of mind. Do you know this morning that when you get in a deep depression, you cannot even think right? You can't. It affects the mind. You have a low opinion of yourself. You have a low opinion of your own abilities. You withdraw from those that you're close to. You won't even come to church. And many a time there's a spirit, a suicidal spirit that the enemy will send against you when you get in a depression. Amen. There can be medical reasons for it. I understand that. There can be a legitimate medical reason for depression. But if there is no medical reason, it is usually because the enemy has planted thoughts in your mind. And you failed to drive out that thought called an imagination, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, and it's areas of wrong thinking that try to exalt the thought of the devil over top of what the Word of God says. And you didn't do that. You grabbed on to the thoughts that the enemy put in your mind. And if you do not cast it down, do you know what happens? A stronghold will develop in your life in the area of your thinking, which is a power base from which the enemy will move in against you and try to destroy your life with it. He'll tell you those people down at that church don't want me down there. He'll tell you you don't need to go to church. He'll tell you nothing but lies. That's true. Honey, you better learn to lose to use your weapons of your warfare yes. that are not carnal, but they're mighty to the pulling yes. down the strong. Yes. Yes. Do you know that they, they failed to drive out those Canaanites that I call depression? And do you know what else? They failed to drive out the Amalekites. You know what the meaning of the name Amalekite is? Dwellers in the valley. That's what it means. They were the number one enemy to attack Israel when Israel came out of the Egyptian bondage. 
And, and they also helped the Canaanites against Israel in Numbers chapter 14. When you get into depression, you will almost invariably go into what I call a spiritual valley experience where these valleys, these dwellers in the valley will come against you. Have you ever been in a spiritual valley, Amanda, where you can't think, you don't even want to go to church, or nothing is right in your life, you can't feel God? Come on, children. Are y'all listening this morning? I'm preaching to myself. Amen. And when you get into that, into a depression, and you get into a spiritual valley, do you know who the enemy brings against you next? Do you remember in 1 Samuel 17, down through this valley, came a, a giant named Goliath, and he came against the people of God for 40 long days. He taunted the people of God. Have you ever had the enemy to speak to you and taunt you? Yes, we all have. And he'll send the giants to you. You know what Goliath was? The Bible, oh, I'd like to come down there, but I can't because they, they got me on this little camera thing here. But do you know what a giant does? Do you know what Goliath was? The Bible said he was a Philistine. And according to Isaiah 2, verse 6, the Philistines were soothsayers. What's that? That's a worker of the occult. Yeah. And do you know what the devil wants to do to you? He wants to put you under his feet. But my Bible tells me that we are the head, we are not the tail, we are the top, and we are not the bottom. Amen? Amen. And the Bible also says that the Amalekites were descendants of Amalek. Do you know who Amalek was? He was a grandson of Esau who despised his birthright. God said in Exodus 17 and 16 that there would be war with Amalek from generation to generation. You see, Amalek learned from Esau. And he hated the descendants of Jacob, the Jewish people. He hated them. And he set out to destroy God's people. Do you know that Haman was a descendant of Agog, who was a king of the Amalekites who hated Jewish people? Mm -hmm. He tried to destroy God's name, God's people. Esau's name meant red earth or earthly or worldliness. And this spirit of the Amalekites is alive and well today. And it wants to destroy you and murder your influence through worldliness. Yeah. Yeah. He wants us to bring the world into the church. I could really preach right there. Yeah, but I just don't have time this morning to get into it. But you listen to me this morning. When he, when he failed to desire his birthright, do you know what he was actually doing? Because the one who had the birthright eventually became the spiritual leader of a tribe and possibly a nation. So what he was saying is, I despise that birthright. I don't want anything to do with Jehovah God. That's what he was saying. And they sold out for something that would satisfy their worldly appetite. And we are to walk in the spirit so that we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Yeah. Brother Richard, we're to call evil, evil. We're to call it by its name. We are to exercise our spiritual authority over it. Get sanctified, stay sanctified, and you will not desire the things of the world. Amen. You see, when you get saved, God says in 2 Corinthians 6 and 17, Come out from among them. Be ye a separate, saith the Lord of hosts. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and my daughters, saith the Lord. But you know the world is watching you and I today. 
And we disgrace the name of Jesus when we say that we are saved, yet we continue to live like the world. Right. I got one amen, amen. on that. Amen. Well, amen, Sister Lou. Amen. <laughs> if you won't amen it, I will. Amen. 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 But we will never win the world to Jesus Christ if we act just like the world. Amen. And don't tell me that you are saved and you're living together in sin outside of marriage or, or you got a homosexual relationship. Come on! Amen. They failed to drive out the enemy. And then, i, I got to hurry. They failed to drive out the parasites. Their name meant dwellers in unwalled villages. They were drifters. They were squatters. Do you know what? That tells me they lack commitment. And the Bible says it is required of a steward that they be found faithful. Too many are in and out and up and down. They stand for nothing and they have no standards. Man, I might not get nobody to me next week, Sister Tangy. But that's okay. The parasites are people who are able to come to church, who can come, but they're willing to stay at home and watch TV. They'd rather do that than come to the house of God and you cannot count on them. That's true. I might catch the virus. I, I realize it's dangerous. I'm not mocking it. I realize that if you can go out ever work else, and yet you're afraid to come to the house of God only, uh-uh, honey. Right. Amen. You use it as an excuse. Amen. And these kind of people don't have time for God. But I've got news for you. you got 24 hours in a day just like I do. You find time for everything else. Listen, it's not a matter of time. It is a matter of priority. And don't tell me you love God if you don't love the body. Come on. Yes. Yeah, that's good. Come on. Yeah. Lack of commitment and faithfulness is a major issue with the people of God. The best friend that a pastor can have is somebody they can count on to be there for every service. Amen. To, to be there to fulfill the job that they have committed to do and you can count on them because they are committed. Amen. And if there's a pastor out there, you ought to be a man of them. Amen. But these were the squatters. They didn't want to be under governmental authority. They didn't want to be under administration of any kind. They didn't live in the major cities. This spirit wants to, wants the, let's put it like, this spirit wants the benefits of what God is doing. But they don't want to help fund what God is doing. Let's see how many amens I get on this one. They don't pay their tithes. They get very little in the offerings. You mentioned you got an online button so somebody can help support the work of the, of the kingdom and they can give to God's work and they will crucify you. Come on, that's true. It's a spirit of greed. It's a spirit of selfishness. Amen. And this spirit sees an unguarded opening in somebody's life and it will squat right there. It's an enemy that needs to be driven out of the lives of God's people. Yeah. And another enemy were the Gergeshites. And their name means dwellers on clay soil. That's what they were. And the characteristics of clay soil is that it's thick, and it's harder than normal soil. Water will not penetrate it well. It is slippery when it's wet. These are those who become gospel hardened. Nothing penetrates. And there is absolutely no growth in their spiritual life. And they can sit in the church service after service and never feel compassion 
and they will not praise God. They have no discernment. They call bad good and good bad. They live on the milk of the word. They cannot take the dessert. Honey, they, I mean the meat of the word. And they're going around and you got to give them a pacifier. And you're constantly having to die for them. And they're 10 or 20 yes. years old. Yes. Come on. Lord Jesus, I may Come never get to preach again. <laughs> but Hosea said, Brother Richard, that we are to break up our fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord until he come and rain down righteousness upon us. Lack of growth is an enemy to the people of God. And then there were the Amorites. Let me hurry through this. They built groves. You know what they were? They, they worshiped out of God, but they were a prideful people. Full of pride. They thought they were better than the other uh, nations that were in there. We don't need nothing from you. You know what that reminds me of? The Laodicean church who said, I am rich and I am increased with good. I have need of nothing. But what did God say about them? He said, you're wretched, you're miserable, you're poor, you're blind and you're naked. You're neither hot nor cold. And I'm going to spew you, vomit you out of my mouth. Y'all still here? And then there were the Hivites. They were what I call compromisers. One of them, one of the princes of the Hivites, Jacob went through the land and he had a beautiful daughter. And the daughter got out one day and wanted to look at the people in the land and see what the other women looked like. And one of the Hivite princes took her and slept with her. And it caused an agreement by the it, it was really it was a, a fraud, but it caused Simeon and Levi and some of them to agree to give their daughters to them and their men to them. In other words, they made a compromise. They made a league with the enemy. What did God say? Make no league with the enemy. And they made this a covenant to intermarry, and it ended up that Simeon and Levi killed all the male from a certain tribe. And what it did, it put in jeopardy the plan of God because Joseph said himself in verse 30, what have you done to me? You could get all of us killed by what you have done. Right. But compromise is an enemy. Listen, you cannot coexist with any of these things. A little laven will laven the whole lump. Right. The world is looking for something that is different from them. Yes, yes. They want something genuine from yes. the They're hungry for something that is real and compromise is an enemy. And if there is no purity, there will be no power. That's right. true. And it's the little foxes that are spoiling the back. And the spirit of compromise is an enemy to the people of God. <laughs> I'll give you a couple more. We'll move on. They failed to drive out the Hittites, whose name means fear and terror. Mm. They were a fierce and a warlike type of nation. But God has not given you and I the spirit of fear. We do not have to fear the devil. He's already been defeated. And fear is an enemy to the people of God. And fear is the opposite of faith. Amen. And the last one, they failed out to drive out the Jebusites. And their name literally meant to be trodden down such as in a threshing floor. You know what it represents spiritually? Discouragement. Now, most pastors have to fight discouragement. Do you hear me? It's discouragement. When folk get that way, do you know what happens? They usually begin to murmur and complain. You know who the flock complains about and murmurs against? The leadership. Yes. Always. They murmured against God's chosen leader, Moses, right. one time. And God said, I'm going to kill them for that. And Moses got in there and interceded, and God kept them alive. But do you know what? Philippians 2 and 14 says, do all things without murmurings. It is an enemy, and it will destroy you. You need to guard against discouragement. Yes. Now let me get back to the 
the original scriptures that I read and pull all of this together about these enemies. Remember in Joshua 17, in our original scripture reading, Joshua was dividing out the land, and there was one of the tribes called Joseph. And they come, they must have sent representatives, and they come to Joshua, and they begin to complain. We don't have that, do we? And they were saying, give us more territory. We're a great people. We need more land. And they were a large tribe. They were made up of the tribe of Ephraim and the half tribe of Manasseh. They were a great people, but they were living below their privileges of the children of God. And so are many of you. All because you're failing to drive out the enemy that was dwelling in the midst of your promised land. Yeah. And do you know what else? They had a problem with laziness and greed. How do you know that from the word of God? At first in verse 12 said they could not drive out the enemy. Then they got strong. The Bible said they went strong. And in verse 13, they did not drive them out. You see, there's a period of time between those two verses. And during that time that they could not and then they did not, uh, what they did, they figured out a way how to use the enemy to benefit them economically and physically. What did they do, Sister Luke? They put the enemy to tribute. And God said, make no league with the enemy. But they did not utterly drive them out. You know what they did? They made slaves out of the enemy. And the enemy had to pay them so much money or whatever what their money system was in that day to be able to get to live in the middle of them. But it cost them. You see, you cannot coexist with the enemy. That's true. They thought the enemy would always be under their control. But the enemy began to wax stronger and it wasn't long and before what they thought they controlled began to control them. That's and true. the enemy began to take over the mountain area, part of Joseph's inheritance. That's what alcohol does to you. That's what drugs do to you. Pornography and other sins that you choose to coexist with, uh, mm. they begin to take you over. And when they complained to Joshua, he simply told them. He said, yes, you are a great people. You will have more territory. If you just go and cut down some trees and destroy their iron chariots on the land that has already been given to you. Y'all yeah. get that? That's what he said. He said, drive out the enemy and move up to higher ground. And I like in those trees, Sister Tangy. I like to look at them as the harmless things that we allow to clutter up our lives. Mm. Trees are good. Mm -hmm. Trees are not always harmful until they keep you from living. Mm. You see, there's some things that are not totally sin, but they hinder your time yes. and your relationship with yes. God. Yes. Even good godly stuff can do that. Right. And then he said, destroy those iron chariots. To me, that's known sin. <clears throat> Things that we do that we know are wrong. Our attitudes and the bitterness and the unforgiveness that chokes the very life out of you if it's not repented of. This tribe walked on lower ground for years because they failed to drive out the enemy from within. What about you and I? Think about it. Are you still struggling with things that you know are not right? Things that do not belong in your heart or in your spirit or in your mind? Think about it. Are there things or, or somebody that you ought to love or, and instead you've got feelings 
of hatred for them and unforgiveness and, and bitterness and you don't even want to be in their presence? If so, that is an enemy. And you will never go any higher with God until you drive that thing out. Because if you are not careful, it will end up destroying you. The music musicians are going to come. We're going to try to finish this up. Hallelujah to God. Amen. Sister Luke, how do I move on to higher ground? How do I continue to, to just put one foot in front of the other? Let me illustrate something for you. There's a monument to a rescue worker in the Swiss Alps. There was a, a group of uh, mountain climbers that went to climb the mountain and a horrible storm came up and they got, they couldn't go any farther so they sent out a rescue team in order to rescue them. And in the midst of that rescue, one of the rescuers succumbed to what was going on and died trying to go get them. And they set up a monument to the rescuer. And do you know what they put on that monument? He died climbing. That's what we need to do. Put one foot in front of the other and keep on climbing. Would you stand? Let me ask you this morning. I know it's been a rough one. I did not. I don't like preaching this one. But I've got to preach what God tells me to preach. Somebody needed it. Somebody needed it. And let me ask you, are you tired of walking on lower ground? Are you tired of being depressed and being discouraged? Do you sit in church and yet you don't receive the word? Are you at the point you can't even feel God anymore? Are you just plain tired of being in that spiritual valley? And having the enemy talk and you constantly speaking in thoughts into your mind. Do you not get tired of that? How do you drive out the enemy? First of all, you've got to recognize it's in there. And then you've got to hate that thing. And then you've got to use the word of God against it as your soul. I want to pray for you that are here this morning. We'll give it all to call in a little while, but I want to pray. Would you bow your heads? Almighty God. Father, I've done the best of my ability. I've given out what you placed in my spirit this morning. I don't understand things, God, but you do. And I pray that whoever's listening and something has touched their lives. Somewhere or other, they've been affected and they've recognized they're walking on lower ground and, and they need to take the territory that God's given them as children of God. And that they've got things that they've got to drive out of their lives. And, and God, you're willing to help them do it if they'll just call on you, if they'll recognize it. Touch somebody's life today. Deliver somebody this morning, God. Save a soul that's closest to eternity lost. Help you know, the people this morning to be able to reach out and go up to higher levels with you that they might be able to be a light in the dark and dying world and souls can be won to the kingdom. Play something, Judy. Listen to this song. She's going to play it, then we're going to give it all to God. I have searched for love. 